change the rest. We'll have to ask around. Okay, so it's 7 30 and we're going to get started. Right. I'm alone in this voice of El Presidente. El Presidente. I have been a coach. All right, so I would be in a coup and I don't want to go. Yes. Okay, anyway, so um, welcome to the November meeting of the Johnson Space and Astronomical Society. It's great to see all of you here tonight. And uh, I'm Doug Holland. And we have a really good um, meeting tonight, I think. We have a lot of really interesting speakers and presentations. We're going to give away some telescopes for free over here. And then we're going to go out to the pizza. So, we're going to do that. So, on our agenda tonight, um, Mark Pichellis up there is going to be our main speaker. He's going to tell us all about Skylab. And Ron's going to say a few words about the BBB library. And I'm going to then explain how our telescope giveaway is going to work, or explain it to a few of you, and explain it to everybody. And after our break, um, I'm going to show you some celestial images that we're taking at the um, Okie Tech Star Party and El Dorado Star Parties. And then Dan, which I'm going to stand here, and we will go for him to do his presentation. Okay, well, Dan was going to tell us about the eclipse at um, happening at JSC. Trevor's got a couple, he's got an Eclipse uh, presentation, and he also has a fun time spraying in the scope. So that'd be And then Paul Haley is going to tell us about going on in Arizona. And I'm going to give you an, a, an update on my radio astronomy efforts. And David's going to tell us all about what's going on in Star Break. Because we've had an incredible amount of events for the last couple of months. Uh, I think more than we've ever had since, at least since I've been here. So it's going to be very interesting. And we'll do our telescope giveaway and give away and pay off a lot of pizza. And that's a lot of work. Okay, so if you would like to um, get uh, on our mailing list, there's a couple ways you can do it. We have two different mailing lists. One of them is uh, just for meetings only. That's the one to Ron at the top there. And the other one's for all general distribution. That's David at the one bottom. So you can either take a picture of this with your phone or write it down real quick. Those email addresses, or at the back of the table back there, there's these little tear offs. You can take those and you can tear those off and uh, send an email to these addresses and get yourself on the distribution. Okay, I forgot to do something else here. Okay, so if you, um, let's see, if you're listening online and you want to submit a question, you can do it by sending an email, a question, or a comment to jcslive at gmail.com. Or you can enter it as a YouTube comment. Trevor's going to be getting those together and giving those uh, comments and questions to us, to the presenters. Now, I should mention, I'd like to mention that I was looking for a cane to see. And it's true that our, our uh, YouTube channel actually gets between 100 and 200 views every month. Wow. So, yes, yeah, so if you go back and look at that, we get a lot of people to uh, view these meetings online. I've, I've been contacted from people, you know, in, in South Korea and uh, people in San Francisco, not really South Korea, and lots of other places, just all over the place, been contacted by people who actually see our meetings and watch watch our YouTube channels. So uh, it's not it's not just us meeting here; there's also other people getting the benefit of our efforts here. Now, okay, before we go on, I would like to we always like to. Uh, See if there's anybody that's this is their first time here. If it's your first time here, raise your hand, tell us your name, and uh, how you found out about the JSCAS and what your interest is in astronomy. Right there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my name is Jay Rivera. Uh, first time being here, I was uh, brought in by my uh, friend Amy. Um, I definitely like uh, astronomy and something I want to get into more and uh, explore. Yeah, the right place. You want a free telescope? <laughs> cool. Okay. Well, I'm going to tell you how to get one here in just a little bit. Ago. And Amy, you've been here before? Uh, probably a long, long time ago. So I'll, I'm basically a new member too. Um, I'm Amy Caldwell. I found out about this meeting through Johnson's uh, daily newsletter. So, yay. 
And I also really enjoy astronomy, although I've been kind of uh, dormant recently, but I like to get more into it. So thank you for having both of us. Great. Well, thank, thank you, Mr. Here. Anyone else that is new or wants to admit that you're new, first time here? We had about 10,000 kids at our star party the other day, so I'm not sure where they all are. I heard that was their party come to a class. <laughs> That's why. Um, thank you. Okay, so if you're a presenter, please remember to use the mouse pointer here so our hundreds of online uh, participants can see what you're pointing at. Okay, don't use a laser pointer, use the mouse laser. All right, so Mark Chalmers is going to be our main speaker. And you guys may remember in the past, we had lots of lights on in here. We couldn't see the screen. Now it's all fixed. There's no lights. It's beautiful. So the problem is now I can see anything because oh, good. Mark's first Mark's first slide is very bright. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to tell you, Mark, what? So should I try to turn on the light at the back? Oh, no. Mark's screen, Mark's slide is so bright, I can read this perfectly. <laughs> Mark, in the dark. Mark in the dark. Okay, so Mark has been around here for a long time. He's been um, a member of JSCAS a lot longer than I have, so I wonder why I'm the president here or not. But, uh, and that's his wife Susan right there. For Susan, they've both been around here since the early 90s. I think. So that's pretty good. He's got his clip shirt on there. He's a space flight enthusiast since he watches the endeavors of the 1960s. Uh, this is introduced to astronomy by his uncle, who had a dime store telescope, but his first real astronomy with a big, he quotes, telescope with a six inch handmade knob borrowed from the JSCAS owner program. Wow. Hey, okay. so astronomy grew. JSCAS, which I assume was Texas Star Party. Watching the experts in quotes again, that's good that you put that in quotes. And JSDAS viewing through their scopes and listening to the advice and stories of past and current JSDAS members. He's always been a star hopping visual observer with two old SCTs, a four year old uh, cast grain plus on eight inch and a 35 year old 10 inch. Background is not in the physics field, but he is a chemical engineer, which, by the way, is the most highly paid field of engineering you go into to deal with all the engineering disciplines. That's why we did that. Chemical engineering. <laughs> yeah, we looked at that when my son was graduating. Which engineering field makes the most chemical engineering? Okay, in polymers, technology and research, he's now retired. So astronomy and astrophysics is a learned effort by study and research. He's currently an active volunteer at Space Center in Houston. I think Susan is too, right? Advocating space flight to the public. Previous JSEAS presentations on the speed of light and rare earth asteroids and planetary tests. So he's actually given us some other presentations too. It was really good. And I've seen this presentation. Mark put a lot of effort into it, so it's going to be good. So join me in. Focusing Mark down here to give us his presentation. Thanks, um, So yeah, so you, you this this topic, Skylab and the Sun. I probably wonder what how is that what is that about? Um, but I have a few questions for everybody before we get started because Maybe it kind of gets sense. How many of y'all do solar astronomy? How many of y'all like to really study the sun as one of your kind of main things? Thank you. Um, how many of y'all are familiar with Skylab? Everybody's familiar. How, how many of y'all actually worked on Skylab or participated with it? <laughs> there's, I think there's a few in our club that are here that are. Some of the more experienced people. Um, and then um, I guess as far as um, doing stuff like this at the Space Center, are, you, are any of y'all uh, volunteers at Space Center Houston? 
I work there. I think, yeah, he, yeah, he works there. Um, okay. So the reason, yeah, so I want to just let you kind of get a sense. The reason I put this, to this topic together is um, we do volunteer space in Houston. It's, it's, a, it's a fun thing to do. Uh, when I got there, I sort of got connected to the Skylab. They had the, the Skylab trainer there on site. And um, so it became a real topic of interest. And, and I guess what struck me for myself is, I, I mean, I remember Skylab from my youth days and stuff, but I didn't really appreciate how central it was to astronomy as part of its mission. Um, and so that intrigued me. And uh, since then, I've, I've tried to learn more about that. And, I've, and I kind of wanted to share that with you. I think you'll find it interesting. So, since this is an, an astronomical society, I figured that would be relevant to you. Um, so, let's just kind of get started. Here's, here's how I want to do this. So, these are the, the things I want to go through with you. Um, we'll talk about Skylab and the ATM. The ATM is the, uh, the Apollo telescope mount. That is the solar observatory on Skylab. And in the picture, it's just the big thing on the side, okay? Um, but I guess to get kind of get going, I wanted to talk about a little bit about how uh, observing the sun was happening um, prior to the 60s and 70s when Skylab went up. Because I, I began to wonder how, why Skylab? Why the ATM on Skylab? What, what really led to that, that partnership? And then, in order to do that, um, we kind of have to explore the sun a little bit. So I've mixed all this together, and we'll um, we'll, we'll go through some stuff. But first, a, a little reminder: some of you are ex are experts on this kind of stuff, um, and some and some of you may have only had a little bit of connection. But let's talk about the electromagnetic spectrum real quick. Just kind of lay the ground. Now I'm going to use this picture from NASA several times in this. I, I, I like the layout of it. Um, but this shows the different uh, wavelengths of light, um, either by frequency or wavelength, kind of what that relates to as far as size. Um, and then there's the overlay of what's transmissible and what's not through the atmosphere. Um, and it's pretty obvious what you can see there is there's a bunch of wavelengths that are just not transmissible through through the atmosphere. So you have to go to space to see those, obviously. Um, and I just wanted to point out, because I was a little uh, unclear, but there, there is a way to convert these two scales from uh, wavelength and frequency, if you didn't know. Um, and it's just really a, a trans, translation through the speed of light. So you can, you can take any of these um, and translate it from frequency to, to, uh, to wavelength. And that's only important in that, as I was researching some of this and looking at some of the experiments done with the ATM and other telescopes, some are discussed in frequency, some are discussed in wavelength, some are discussed, discussed other ways. And unless you kind of translate between this part of the So that's that. And then I wanted to just reconnect us with. Uh, excuse me. In this picture, energy is also there. I cannot see that. Really. Is the energy mentioned there also? Oh, what? Sorry? Energy with in, wavelength. Not, not in this one. <clears throat> not, in the... not in this one. There okay. will be in, in, in another one. So moving on, um, this is just an, a, an, a, another overlay. It's a different chart, but the overlay on this is the temperature scale. And so this provides kind of a sense of the temperature of the object and where its primary uh, EM spectrum is, is going to overlay. And so that's why, you know, our sun is a, is a 6,000 degree sun. Uh, surface temperature, and that's, you know, in the visible area, but there's a corona that's, you know, many millions of degrees, 
and that's um, in the X-ray spectrum is, is where that's going to be. So th this gives a good sense for how that uh, how that temperature relates to that. Um, and then the next piece is getting back to this photon energy. I think that's kind of your question. Is um, a lot of the telescopes that are in the X-ray and gamma ray are talked about in photon energy rather than wavelength. And there is a way to convert from these energies to a um, to a KEV type uh, uh, scale. So that's just another, and that's that's Planck's law. Uh, that just kind of gives a sense to how you convert on all these different scales to the different um, different energies. But you're welcome to go and study all that yourself. <laughs> yeah. uh, so now let's talk about this and how it relates to stars, because that's kind of where we're headed. Um, so stars, um, of course, they emit across you know, across the spectrum. Um, if you go over to this table over here, you can see the different uh, wavelength uh, and types of radiation, the rough range of temperature that they that they have. So visible, um, you know, is a thousand to ten thousand degrees, um, and you can kind of see where these different types of, uh, of radiation are actually emitted from. Um, and then another piece is a lot of times reading in literature and stuff, a lot of things are referred to as black body radiation, the, an object that reflects a black body type um, spectrum. And, um, and you can kind of see how that changes uh, as far as frequency and, uh, and also as far as in intensity, depending on the temperature of the objects. Uh, and then we can just kind of cover that up a little bit. And this relates back to our star. So I think at one time there was, we were gonna be having a presentation on the HR diagram, give a little bit more about the stars. This is just a rough table on the different types. And our, type, our star is type G. Um, and you can see the, the characteristics there. And a lot of this many of y'all know as far as star types. Okay. But, I just wanted to kind of lay that groundwork out there so that we can all be on the same page for how this is going to arrive. So the next piece, um, how do we study the sun? So I was trying to position how do we, what was going on before the space age, basically? Because that's when Skylab kind of came into, into being. And, you know, this, this helps to me, for me. Uh, you know, for most years, for several hundred years, everything was done by telescope projection. Um, they would project it on a piece of paper and draw it. And, you know, there's, um, you know, even things from like Langley in 1873, it's a very detailed, but it's still do doing things by drawing. Um, spectroscopes came into, in, in, in the late 1800s, and they got connected to the telescopes. And that's the first time they started to have spectroscopy through the scopes of uh, things like the sun. But uh, when you get into the um, into the space age, the very first things were from sounding rockets that would go up and come back down. This is an interesting one from '46, where as the elevation increased on this rocket, you can see more of the ultraviolet transmitted through the atmosphere. So that's just this, you know, that, that gives that concept of how the atmosphere is blocking uh, some of the wavelengths. Mark, I got a question. Uh -huh. Okay, so I've always wondered about this. I don't know if you know the answer to this or not, but, you know, if you ever watch a V2 fly, mm -hmm. it's not, you know, it turns around and it's doing all kinds of crazy things. How do they keep this thing pointing at the sun to be able to make a spectrum? I've never... You know what I mean? Yeah. And so the question was, how do they keep things stable enough to yeah. do some reasonable yeah, with the, with the V2? Yeah. yeah. Um, when I when I was reading and for this, that was a real restriction. I mean, they, they could only get sometimes just seconds of the data okay. before they they could they wouldn't be on on target. 
Um, it wasn't until some of the satellites came about where they started to be able to actually point them with some reason. Oh, and, that, and, and that accuracy just got better and better as time. Okay. Um, and, and of course, one thing is, uh, you know, the, the balloons came into being in the late 50s. Um, and that became another platform for doing a lot of observations because those could stay at altitude for many, many, many days or hours. So now let's talk about spacecraft. Uh, well, first let's talk about what what did we know about the sun in the 60s? Um, I mean, we knew there was an 11-year cycle. We knew the poles flipped. Uh, we knew nuclear processes drove the sun. Um, we knew about the temperature of the core and the corona and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we knew there were solar, the SEPs were out there on, on sorry, on um, that they came after uh, large flares and we could detect them on Earth. We knew the surface had these uh, cells and spicules and the Earth had this big magnetic cocoon, right? We knew all that stuff. That's Everybody knows that today. But that was all new stuff back then because it was just some of the discoveries happening. Um, and these are some of the things that were, you know, drawn or written down at that time. This is, this was, you know, the view of the sun and what it looked like. Uh, this was the spectroscopy from you know, these different wavelengths and how, uh, you know, the, the, how the characteristics were. Uh, this was the mental picture of what the sun looked like. Um, and, and just to note, all of the things on here that, that I, I referenced is from this book called The Quiet Sun. Um, it's written by Ed Gibson. He was actually one of the astronauts on Skyline. So um, his book in 1973 is kind of set the standard for what, what do we know about the sun? And that and this is some of the stuff that was out of it. So going into Skylab, this is what was known. This is what they knew. So now let's talk about satellite observations. Of course, satellites didn't get into space until the 60s. Um, as far as doing a lot of the astronomy. And you're going to remember some of these names, but I wanted to go through the history of that and how that led up to that discussion. SOLRAD. You all remember the SOLRAD name as far as some satellites. These, these were small. You can see they were 20 to 100 kilograms. Um, there was actually seven of them in the early 60s, and they would orbit in a pretty elliptical orbit, 1,000 to 1,000 kilometers, 100 to 1,000 kilometers. Um, but these were the first solar observatories. Um, the next were these explorers. And many of y'all probably remember the Explorer series. There's many of those for different aspects. Uh, but you can see the size of them. This Here's a person standing here next to this one. But you can see the size. They were pretty large, uh, a couple hundred kilograms. Um, but they, these became actual platforms where they could actually study things. So that this is where a lot of the knowledge came for solar observing uh, in, in the 60s. But you can see how many went up in, the, in that 10 year time frame. It was a lot. After those two programs, or with those two programs, the big solar observatory program was called OSO, Orbiting Solar Observatories. Um, it, these were the big ones. They're two to three hundred kilograms. The scopes were a meter long, um, so you're starting to get to see some size with them. And these started to have um, pointing capabilities more in line with what you would want for, to do these observations. You can see here a table. It kind of gives a sense of all the different uh, types of experiments they were doing on them. Um, so you can tell, you know, with these with this group of satellites, this was uh, this was the, the set that really started to create the data for, for the solar observing. Um, just wanted to point out that there was another one called the Advanced OSO. It was going to be a big one, greater than 600 kilograms. Uh, it was going to be uncrewed. It was going to go under orbit. Um, so this was going to follow on to these. It got canceled in 1965. Okay. But what's interesting about this, um, a side story <laughs> in this whole time frame is 
this is one of the things that kind of, kind of came across is in 62, kind of a random thing, the US conducted this Starfish Prime nuclear test at 400 kilometers, basically in space. And uh, the electromagnetic pulse from that, it, it wasted the OSO1 solar cells, plus a bunch of other satellites that were in orbit. It's just one of those things that's going on at that time, you know, and um, so it's just kind of a curious tie to, to what's going on in, in the 60s. So let's talk about the Apollo telescope now. Um, and this is where really the game changed completely. So the ATM, uh, it was conceived in 62, it was going to, to extend those other programs, the target was to get it in orbit by 1969 for the solar maximum. That was the intent. But it had large telescopes, full wavelengths. It, it had temperature control of its thing. You can kind of, you can look at the table for all the different uh, wavelengths it was going to look at and, and specs. But over here and here, you can see, this is the size of it. I mean, it's it's large. You can see the weight. It's basically 12 tons. Uh, very large telescope, um, 11 feet in diameter, 14 feet high. Uh, this is just a very large scope. And you now we've seen the pictures of Skylab, and you see how big that piece of equipment is sticking off the side. But this this is what this is what came to be. Now, what's interesting about this is it was originally planned as a uh, standalone orbiting observatory. And this is how it was going to be. Um, we were going to have the ATM here. They were going to attach a limb to it, a lunar lander. And the lunar lander was going to be the crew quarters whenever the crew crews came up to visit it. Because keep in mind, this is this is being built in the 60s. Um, most of the observations got recorded to film. So crews were going to have to go up periodically and retrieve the film so that they could bring that back to Earth and download it and, and, and observe. So that was the initial plan for the ATM, which is kind of curious. But let's go on and look a little bit more at the age. So now you see how big this thing is, and this is just some pictures of, of, of it being built. Um, I mean, you can see the size of one of the instruments when you, and you can see the size of this. When you look down on the top of it, this is how all the seven telescopes were mounted inside. So that they had all their own little cavity. But most of these were, you know, several, many feet long. There's actually a restored ATM at the Smithsonian. So if you ever go up there, you can see what, what it would have looked like. And just another thing aside that I found is, as I was researching all this, you know, with the Apollo applications at that time, this picture was a 1967 contact, con, uh, concept of an orbiting telescope. And when you look at that, it's like, this is like, this is the Hubble and the space shuttle, right? I mean, <laughs> I mean in 67, it, it already looked like that. It's just, it's kind of remarkable how some of the boys, some, some, some of the things that were going on. All right, so let's talk again about the objectives. So remember, we went through the whole series of um, Explorer satellites, the OSOs, all that stuff. One thing that's hard to get a sense is what, what was it actually? What were those actually observing? So I put on here a, a, just a layout on what wavelengths those all those were observing, and and this is this is what it was. So you can kind of see all those different um, uh, satellites and what wavelength sections they were observing of the sun, and it's it's all over the place. But there's there's a lot of overlap on every one of them. But this kind of gives a sense to, to where they were. And then here, this was the ATM on Skylab. And it was uh, mostly here, not in the gamma and X-ray, uh, the high X-ray range. OK? And that's just a quick visual of, of where those were. So now let's talk about Skylab. 
and how it evolved as a platform for the ATM. Because it's, it's kind of an interesting story. If, if you all are, if you like the Apollo days and stuff like that, um, Apollo was actually an orbiting lab concept in 61. So they were going to convert it into, into a, uh, uh, a space station. Um, what's interesting about Skylab is it started out as what was called a wet workshop. And what that meant was, if David was here, it was a Saturn 4B uh, stage, um, which is the third stage of the Apollo rocket. It was going, uh, sorry, the third stage was going to be sent up on the set on the S4B, um, and it would be um, fully fueled and all that, and it would get itself into orbit. When it got to orbit, the astronauts would then outfit it to be a station. And so they were going to use the hydrogen tank as the orbiting lab. Um, and that's that was called the wet workshop. And that was the concept that kind of stayed uh, for a while until there was a competing one for a dry workshop, which is basically uh, the S4B would be launched on a Saturn V, and uh, it would not have fuel in it, and it would already be fully outfitted. So that's the Skylab we know. And this got changed in uh, in sixty in uh, um, in the in the late sixty the official change. Um, and what made this possible is when the, the, the moon landings for eighteen, nineteen, and twenty Apollo's got canceled. So then we had parts parts left over to um, to, to create Skylab. And there's actually two Skylabs that were built. I don't know if you know that. There's, there's another flight ready sky that got built, and it's actually at the Smithsonian in um, Washington. Okay, so that's some history of getting Skylab going. Um, and so Skylab became a big mission, and these were the objectives for Skylab. And it was the first space station that the US put up into orbit. So um, you can imagine what it was going to be for. And it's basically, this was the headline, right? Make uh, useful for man's endeavors on Earth. Um, so really human adaptive, you know, how humans lived in orbit, that was a real key. Uh, but the solar physics and astronomy became a big part of it because of that partnership with the ATM. They also had a bunch of Earth resources observatories uh, and then a bunch of other science things. We'll, and we'll talk about those in a little bit. Um, but I wanted to just, just remind you, and you can think back for some of y'all that were here in 72, um, kind of what the landscape was at the time. Uh, the Apollo moon landings, they were done and complete in 72. Now, of course, Skylab got approved in, in the late 60s, so it was already on its way. Um, but as far as people living in space, the longest U.S. astronaut at that time was Gemini 14, uh, sorry, Gemini 7. Uh, 14 days. And then the, the longest Soviet astronaut at that time was 18 days on Soviet is not. So, uh, and of course, space shuttle was in full development by then. You can see that for living in space, there was very little experience. So this was, this was a big thing. And then we can talk about the crews that went real quick. There was three. The first one, they launched in 73. So last May, it was 50 years ago. Okay. This, this is all 50 years ago. There was three, three astronaut crews that went. The last crew left in 74. So you, you can see it only got used for a year and a half for those three crews. Um, and then had an undesired orbit in 79. Some of y'all probably remember that. We'll talk about that. But something maybe to just, I, I circled, um, total there was 171 days in space for those crews. The longest was 84 days. Um, they had 42 hours of EVAs. So they did a lot of stuff. And there's actually this SEVA, which stands, up, stands for Stand Up EVA from the Apollo Command Module. Yeah, I'll talk about that in a second. That's pretty unique. And this is the cruise that went up. 
Um, so of the nine guys, um, Joe Kerwin and Jack Luzma and Ed Gibson are still still with us. In fact, uh, Joe Kerwin and Jack Luzma, they came to Space Center Houston last May. We got that. Interesting fellows. So let's move on to um, what Skynet looked like. Just to kind of give an overview, it's it had all these segments that were put together um, into the cluster, and then the Apollo capsule would come and visit it and bring the crews back and forth. Um, you can kind of see the the layout here. So this was the third stage of the rocket. This would have been the hydrogen tank here. The oxygen tank was down here on this end. Of course, they were empty. But they were fully outfitted with the whole Skylab station layout already built. Um, there was an airlock section so that they could go outside and service the ATM and do things. And then there was this uh, docking adapter here that had a way for the capsule to dock here. And they had a side port here for a backup. So that's that was the layout. The ATM was here. And then had, the plan was two big solar panels. So that's that is the big layout of the station. Mm -hmm. so Question. ATM, are you saying that they gathered the uh, the film from within the airplane? They went on spacewalks to go up to the top of the telescope and recover the film from the instruments. Oh, they had to go on spacewalks to get the yes. film off the telescope. Yeah, the AT yeah, the ATM was developed as a as a platform with. Uh, all its observations on film. Oh, but they had to go outside. So they still had to go out and, and go to it. Oh my goodness. Yes. They could control it from inside. Yeah. They just couldn't get the film from inside. Okay. So that's the layout. And then here's real quick and on size. Maybe kind of give you a sense of size. Um, I like this little graphic. It's a little, it kind of compares several things. So here's Skylab up here. Um, here's Mir. Many of y'all probably remember Mir as the primary Russian space station for a while. And they're roughly the same. Here's the shuttle. You can see the size. Skylab's in that range as far as length and stuff. Um, and here's the ISS footprint. So quite a bit bigger. But you can get a sense of how large it was, right? Um, and then just Kind of some quick if you compare Skylab to Mir, they had about the same volume. Uh, Skylab was two thirds of the weight, and then if you compare Skylab to ISS today, it's a third of the habitable volume, um, but it's a, a fifth of the weight. Okay. So that kind of gives you a sense of size of Skylab. Let's talk about how it got launched real quick. So this was the whole stack, the whole platform put together. This was the S4B's the set the stage. Here's the hydrogen tank. The oxygen tank was down here. Um, here's the airlock, the docking adapter, and then the ATM was rotated up to the front, to the top. So it fit inside the fairing of the rocket. So you can see this whole piece here um, laid out at the top of the Saturn V. So the Saturn V first and second stage had enough capacity to lift this hundred tons up to orbit, and that's how they that's how they got it up. Um, Skylab's orbit it was solar dominant, meaning it pointed at the sun almost all the time. And there was some changes when they when they did Earth red, Earth uh, observations. Um, but another thing, just to appreciate a Skylab for just to get a concept of the whole mission is it was a real logistics issue because they outfitted the station for all three crews for the whole time. So they had to have all the water, all the food, all the oxygen and nitrogen because they had to create their atmosphere, um, all the science experiments and anything they needed, all their clothes and toiletries and entertainment, all that stuff launched um, at the first launch. <laughs> they, they had to plan all that basically a year and a half in advance, all that, all that stuff. It was, it was pretty remarkable how they, how they 
uh, outfitted it. <laughs> uh, let's talk about the launch, because this is actually one of the things that defines Skylab. Uh, it, um, and, and, I, and I put it like this, the launch anomaly. So it got, the plan was, this is a picture with uh, the Saturn V ready to launch here and uh, the Saturn 1B behind it to carry the first crew. The plan was launch the Saturn V, get it into orbit, get Skylab up and going, and the crew launches the next day and goes and visits it and starts doing their thing. Um, 63 seconds into launch, a meteor, meteoroid shield, sun shield that they had around the, the main part of Skylab, uh, managed to come loose and it decided to not stay with the rocket anymore. So it came off um, and when they looked back it was because of some vibration and pressure issues. Um, but it continued into space. They could observe that one of the one of the um, solar panels on Skylab had opened in the launch because they could see it was generating power. So they knew something got messed up. Um, and, but then almost 600 seconds into the launch, that panel stopped, uh, stopped, stopped powering anything. And it got blown off when the second stage finished and the uh, retro rockets at that stage um, hit the panel and knocked it off. The other panel, did not come loose, thank goodness. Um, and uh, but that's that's the state they were in. So this was this became a test real quick. Um, and this is what it kind of looked. So this is what happened without. So without the shield, there was no way to keep that sun from heating it up as much as it, uh, as it would. So it was over 130 degrees inside, which basically put everything at risk. Um, and without the solar panels out, because the other one, they knew it was there, they could tell it was there, but they, it was gen not generating any power. So they didn't understand what was going on. They figured it was not, it had not come open. Um, but they had very little power. Fortunately, when they built it, they did tie the solar panels on a the ATM into the main grid for the Skylab as a backup. So they had enough power from those to at least keep the station alive while they figured out what to do. So the key was they had to get some cover over this thing to stop it from heating so bad and get that other panel open. And so this is this is the save. Um, in 10 days time, they probably in three days time, they figured out what they were gonna do. They basically created these things of basically putting a cover over Skylab. And they had these three different designs. Um, and this one became known as the Parasail, which got, uh, which was developed at, at Johnson Space Center. Uh, here's a picture of them sewing it. It's basically just a piece of fabric with mylar on it and stuff like that. Um, and this is how it was going to be deployed. Inside Skylab, there's an airlock that pointed to the sun side. Um, they were going to fit this thing on um, some poles, and you can kind of see it sticking out here through the airlock. It was going to unfold like an umbrella and then cover Skylab. So that's what they flew up to Skylab on that first mission. And, um, and they, that's what they did. It worked. At the same time, they took up basically electrical line covers because they weren't quite sure what they were going to try and do, and they, uh, they were able to free the solar panel about 10 days into the mission. So uh, this was a very unique thing to, to happen. It was um, the guy who developed it actually went to the hardware store and got a bunch of fishing poles, and he figured out how to make it all work before they actually flew it up. So it was pretty unique. So this, now, now we had an operating station. And you can see the picture here. This is the first crew when they left. You can see that parasail, parasol sticking out the side. There's the one solar panel, not two. Um, but on this, after the second mission, 
they actually installed another one over the top of that one because that one was degrading. So that's why when you look at pictures of Skyland, they can look different because they actually have two covers over that part of the Skyland. And then here in this picture, you can see the ATM and all the scopes at the top of it. So that was Skyland being ready for service. So a few things maybe about what it looks like on the inside. Some of these pictures are from Space Center Houston and some are from Orbit. Um, but this is the main area where the hydrogen tank is. And you can see it's 22 feet in diameter, very large, big space, just a big dome. This is looking, if you were standing in this um, airlock here, you could look back and this is what it would look like in orbit. Um, this is one of the astronaut Gary sitting at the ATM console in the, in the, uh, at the docking adapter. Uh, this was their toilet. This was their eating place. First toilet that was on uh, in space. And then here was um, a look at one of the trainers that happens later. So it kind of gives you a sense on how, how they, what their, what their living arrangements were. And then I thought we would quickly go through um, maybe kind of, you know, what, what they were doing and what and how they were scheduling their time. Of course, you know, you see a lot of things of people in space and they had a bicycle that they rode. They, this was their sleeping arrangement where they had some tie downs. Of course, they had to do a lot of maintenance and stuff. But this was one of their daily schedules. And I, and I circle on there how much time they, they were spending operating the ATM. So you can see from this much time in one day, how much, how much effort they put into doing solar astronomy. It was, uh, it was, it was pretty important to, for the mission. And that's really what I wanted you to kind of get from that. Some more pictures of them. Um, some of the astronauts when they were up, of course, just regular living stuff. Uh, there is, they did have a shower on the, uh, on Skylab, um, they could only use five or six pints of water, um, not a whole lot. Um, and it was taking them one to two hours to shower. So they, 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 over time, they just didn't use it very much. And it kind of informed future missions. Uh, and that's why, you know, on the space station today, they don't have showers because it's, it, it's just, they, they learned on Skylab, it was just too difficult, too much time. So that's just some pictures of them. Uh, they did a lot of work on understanding the body. You can see some pictures here of stuff they did. Um, you can look at some of these experiments they did, bone mineral stuff, red blood cell stuff. Uh, there was one uh, medical doctor that flew on the first mission. So kind of he kind of led that all out. But you can you can see, um, you, you can tell from their schedules and from Things that they did, that they did, they spent a lot of time on medical stuff. Um, other science stuff, they had 13 other science experiments, 26 in the technology realm, uh, six Earth resources ones. And then before Skylab flew, they put out a call for students to submit experiments and they selected 19 of those to go up. So they actually worked uh, some, some for, uh, for students. Um, and you can kind of get a sense of, of the range of those. Uh, they had a materials furnace on board so they could heat up metals. Um, here's a picture of them without doing, getting the film canisters from the ATM. Um, they were able to fly what became later as the hand maneuvering unit that we've famously seen on, on uh, the space shuttle stuff. Uh, but they flew one inside the sky. Uh, so that was uh, a big program for them. And then uh, this is just one showing uh, they're, they're uh, doing one of the student experiments. This, this one actually was about uh, the spider. They took some spiders up to build webs. So that kind of gives you a sense of, of that, right, that realm. Uh, I thought I would throw in stuff about food because everybody talks about, everybody wants to know about food. Or uh, astronauts and stuff. 
They, um, this is their menu. You can, you can see it's pretty good menu, quite varied. Um, they did have a refrigerator and a freezer on, so they could they could bring up a lot of stuff. Uh, their daily menu, menus are scheduled, so they knew on day 28 for meal two what they were going to eat. They already knew. Um, they ate about 3,000 calories a day. You know, a lot of food sent up initially. Uh, all the water had to go, and, but this is how much water they had, and it averaged out to about a gallon and a half per person per day. Not a lot. Uh, all food and water were material balanced, meaning they measured everything that went in and they measured everything that came out. So um, that was part of their whole medical stuff. Okay, you can see this is them in the, in the trainer showing their eating table. That they had. Uh, most of their food was in these tin cans, like tuna cans. Um, and then they could put them in these slots and heat them or cool them or whatever they wanted. It was, a, it was a unique thing for food for them. And then a few side stories about them. Um, uh, because uh, Skylab was pretty unique, uh, they actually had to plan for a rescue. The second mission that went up, the uh, thrusters on the command module uh, were leaking, and they weren't sure that was going to make it back to Earth. So they quickly, and we're talking pretty quick, they created a five-seat command module um, so that they could send that up with two guys and retrieve the three and bring them all back. So this is a pretty unique thing. They actually built one. They had it put on a rocket and it's extended by for, the, for that time of the mission. But the one that they built is now at uh, KSC, if you ever want to see the five-seater. It's, it's the only one, only one there. Um, this was interesting. If they put in this fireman's pole. Um, they were worried before they flew because, you know, people get in space and you don't have any motive force moving you around, that they would get in the middle of this big dome and get stuck, and they couldn't get themselves out of this big space. So they put this big pole in there across the middle um, just in case. So on the first mission, they had that. They found over time they didn't they didn't need that. But that's the kind of worries that they had with something like this. Uh, trash um, that was a big thing. They generate a lot of trash. You got to do something with trash in space. It's a it's a it's a it's a hassle, right? Um, they used the oxygen tank. Remember, they had the empty oxygen tank. They used that as a trash tank. So they had an airlock that they could dump their trash in all these bags and then put it in the airlock and cram it in the oxygen tank. So that became the trash tank. And then when it when it re-entered, re it uh, or all burned up. They did get worried sometimes. They got stuck once, and they were really sweating out what they were going to do with all the trash if they couldn't use it. But, so it's things like that they had to deal with. And then... Um, they also worked on, uh, had to figure out how to work in space. Um, and they did, they had a lot of forethought into this. So they actually did put, built these shoes. And the main thing was these triangular, triangular clips that fit on the bottom. And they would, they could latch those into the floors so that they could stay stable wherever they wanted to be. And you know you don't when you when you look at Skylab you don't really notice but once you know that that's what that was for there, I mean there's triangles everywhere and that was that was one of the ways they could uh... and then I wanted to touch on the deorbit because it's it's a it was a big thing back then um, it was launched in '73 the predictions were it was gonna it would last basically until the shuttle got to it. And they were going to use the shuttle and boost it up and use that was the plan. But um, in the late uh, 70s, the orbit decayed, de decayed a lot quicker than planned. Um, you can kind of see the track here, and you can tell when the it, it changed. And what changed was the solar um, activity in the solar maximum was worse than they expected. 
you know, expanded the atmosphere and it caused it to uh, to deorbit quicker. They tried a lot of stuff to extend it, but uh, in the end, it came down. Um, it ended up coming down basically over Southwest Australia, most of it in the ocean on that orbit, but some of it over Australia. Um, it was a big thing back then. Um, it was, some of y'all may remember, but it was a big thing. Um, it, and one of the reasons it was such a big thing is the year before, the Soviets had a satellite come down across Canada at some point. But the thing about that one is it had a nuclear thermal generator on it. So they spread nuclear material across Canada. So everybody thought Skylab probably had the same. So there was this huge fear about it. And it got played up in the press and stuff. But it was a big thing. Of course, you know, having 100 tons come down, you probably do want to worry about that. But um, so some pieces ended up in Australia. There's actually a museum down there if you want to go visit it. Uh, uh, they did find NASA 200 bucks for, for litter. <laughs> and then here's some quick pictures of the trainer. If you ever go to Space Center Houston, if you've seen it, um, I'll just show you this. This was the trainer when it was being used. It was vertical. And then here's the other pieces. Uh, but when you go and see it today, it's horizontal. You can see the ATM on the side um, and all the pieces there. And then, of course, they have a, they had a capsule that they played with as well. There's a picture of the nine astronauts in the trainer uh, that was taken. Okay. All right. Let's go back to astronomy real quick and try and close this out. So just some statistics for, you know, the whole point of this was to understand why Skylab is such a solar astronomy success. Um, they actually conducted 725 hours of observations. That ended up at four, over four hours a day, which is a lot when you talk about that, that, that mission. Um, you know, what was unique is they were well-trained. Of course, Gibson was the guy that wrote the book. They were real enthusiastic. Um, they could make repairs as they need. They ended up retrieving 170,000 photographs. Oh, so it was a lot. And what was more unique is they were in orbit when Common Kotech came by. So they were able to do observations for that. Um, here's some of the data that they that they were able to, to, to get. Um, you know, they were, because with the astronauts on board, they were able to track things and get things in sequences. Uh, they vastly improved the spectral data that they had at the time. Uh, they could catch real time events. This became a real famous flare because of the size of it at the time. Um, they could track these coronal discharges over time and then they could do things like you know take photography over many orbits and then you know, stack them all together so it, because they were able to be there with the scopes um, they were able to do a lot you know, a lot more science than initially planned and some of the discoveries real quick that, that from that they you can go and uh, look look more into these if you want, but polar balding zones apparently is a thing. Um, and it's they apparently looked at the poles. Um, and uh, it, they mostly show up in the UV space, but these are these are coronal holes uh, that that uh, release the magnetic field. These polar giants. Spicules, I think it's called. Uh, apparently, that was unknown at the time. There were spicules known, but these were large and they lasted a long time compared to the other the other ones. So that was a uh, something that had never been seen before. And then they were able to uh, clarify coronal holes and how they formed um, the sources of them. And then they could they could actually measure them in different wavelengths to to do that. So that was some of the discoveries that weren't well known before. Scott. 
So now we're 50 years later after Scott Mack. And we kind of seen what they were able to do as far as solar observing. Um, and this is where we are now, right? Solar science, it's a priority now. There's, there's, there's a lot about it. Space weather is tracked. Most of y'all probably look at the space weather website to, to see what's going on. Um, and the knowledge has really expanded. These are the current models that are, are pictographs that NASA has published. And, you know, they're able to get things down to, you know, 50 miles as far as knowledge of, of things about the sun. Um, and of course, you know, the detail is significantly better now, uh, kind of where we are. But you know, this is all, all the stuff that's, that's now uh, just come clearer for us. And then I wanted to put on here, because I was trying to, you know, tie this back to, uh, you know, satellites in space and, and what's observing the sun. So these are all the ones that are the heliophysics missions, basically observing the sun. Uh, these are broken down into uh, primary operations, which they call two of them, which are the solar orbiter and the Parker Solar Probe. Some of you all probably followed those. Uh, but there's all these that got launched before that have been extended because many of them got launched even back in the into the 90s and they're still operating. So that's this whole list here. And then all the ones in yellow are the ones that are coming. So this is an incredible visual to me on how much has been done, how much is being done, and how much is coming as far as solar heliophysics and, and, and the observations. And this is across uh, NASA and ESA and JAXA. But I was pretty impressed by being able to, to understand that. And then back to this, the places where those, those current satellites are operating are in these regions. The last one to go up was this goes R as far as the um, it's actually one of the National Weather Service satellites. Um, so that's that one. Uh, what I found interesting is this one, the wind, which is in, in the 90s, it actually is looking in the uh, radio the radio area. They have um, some detectors that weigh out on booms on this thing that's going through space so they can get the, get the resolution. But, but again, you can kind of see some of these are very targeted. Some of them are quite broad. Uh, again, it gives you a sense on um, on what's being studied. And then this is just, if, if you were to go to all these observatories and look, this is what you can get now, today, daily, hourly. Most of these are updated hourly. Um, so, you know, the, all these different wavelengths and, and what the sun looks like, you can go and find these at each of these websites. For, um, for all these. Uh, one that just recently started up is this NUA solar telescope on Maui, and it's got incredible resolution of the, of the surface of the sun. Um, and then uh, they also have all these energetic particles and solar wind data, all that stuff. So this is, when you go to the space weather websites, this is the kind of stuff that's available to you And then I just kind of wanted to finish with a few things. I, I just, I'm just intrigued at how things like this have progressed. You look at the spectroscopy of these Fraunhauer lines, um, and you can see, you know, where it was back in the 30s and 40s, and then how it got so much better with Skylab as far as the, the distinction. And then you look at what can be done today. Um, it's just, you can just really see the progression of, of technology through time. And then um, we can finish out with this. There's a, this was an interesting um, video that they had on this solar tornado that's happening. There's a lot of debate about whether that's really a tornado or if it's just, an, just looks that way. It's, it's pretty, pretty curious. Mm -hmm, looks like a spinning. 
And then um, this is a 72 hour sequence of, uh, of the sun in UV. But it's, um, and then of course these other ones are just uh, other things that have been, that I thought were quite interesting that have been done. And I think that's about it. So I hope, um, I, hope we, I hope I kind of took you through a little journey of solar astronomy, where it was, how Skylab changed it, where it is today, um, and, uh, and how, you know, how that contribution was important in the 70s. And then there's a, if you ever, if you want to look, there's a bunch of references here, if you're, if you want to go back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's all I have. Yeah, so yeah, I guess a couple questions for you. But so the the mock up there is Space Center Houston. How accurate is the ATM part of this? You know, compared to what it really looked like the inside from the astronauts saw. So, so the the scope there, since it was not primary. Science Center for the ATM the scope is is true size, true layout. Um, it doesn't have any scopes in it. Right. Okay. So, so all they saw was actually the console that they worked at. They, they worked from the console on the inside. Correct. Uh, how accurate is that compared to real time? Oh, it was it was it was actually it, it was exact because they actually did use that for their training. So the console, the one at Space Center Houston, the one at Space Center Houston, yes, <laughs> yeah, the, the one at Space Center Houston, they used. Uh, I mean, it's it's identical to what flew. Okay, everything worked in it back in the seventies, early seventies. They had to be basically trained in that for a couple of years before they. Yeah, went wasn't on. that moved from Building Five over to Space Center? Yeah, it was, yeah, it was in uh, ninety-one. They moved it over from Building Five. Yeah, and yeah, that's right. They um, they moved it over to Space Center Houston, and Space Center Houston got built in '92, I think it was when it opened. They had to build a building around it because they didn't. So it's it is not going anywhere. <laughs> it's a it's a really interesting display, and I, and I have to tell you, most people do not know about Sky. It's a, it was very invisible between the uh, between the moon landings and the space shuttle. It's it's interesting. As you can see, it was it was very important and quite advanced a lot of stuff. Can you tell them just a little bit about your recent experience? Oh yeah, so, so you know that uh, so that got brought over in ninety one from Building Five. Uh, it got packaged up, put on a flatbed, sent over, and laid down and built built around it. Some of the cabinets in there have never been opened. What? Oh, yeah. Really? And so in the last, uh, in May, it was the first time they opened some cabinets in 50 years. And there was stuff still in them. Oh, wow. Really? Yeah. And we opened some last Sunday, actually. And there was, there's still stuff in them. What kind of stuff? Um, there's a lot of food tins. There's uh, medical equipment. There's uh, some of the equipment that goes with some of the experiments. Um, wow. It's it's really it's pretty interesting to, to see that's, you know to, to kind of find what's out. Yeah, it's curious. Another display case for all that. Anything else? Yeah. Any questions for Mark? Fantastic presentation. Thank yes, you. Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, I got a second. Jim's, uh, that was, I, I can tell you a lot of work. I really appreciate it. Okay. I assume that was Jim. Hmm? I assume that was Jim that said that. Is that you, Jim? That's what, Jim? Is that you? About what? Your comment. In yeah. yeah. So here's all of Mark's extra information. <laughs> okay. All right, so next, uh, I'd like to invite Ron to tell us a little bit about the DVD library. I'm going to give you some light there. <laughs> it's right there in the back. <laughs> There's 200 DVDs there that have been donated. 
Uh, the vast majority, 80% of them are from Astronomy Magazine. It's got a legend on top, so you'll know if it's Discovery, PBS, or Astronomy Magazine. They're generally about 45 minutes long. But there's also the... Uh, the, uh, the uh, the great courses. The great courses, and we have a, we have several of those that have been and they're excellent. But those are over ten hours long, so be aware of that. But the others are about forty five minutes, so you're more than welcome to take as many as you want out. It's bring back. But anyway, thank you. Thank you for doing that, Ron. And uh, Ron and I were having a little email discussion. He. He's making the observation maybe a lot of people don't have DVD players, but interestingly enough, I was just at Walmart last week and I saw a DVD player is on sale over there. Really? Yeah. So really. I think there's hope. And and I still have one checked out, Ron. Just want you to know I know where we got one. So during the break, when you're not looking at free telescopes, you can go up there and get yourself a DVD from the DVD library. Okay, so um we're gonna we're gonna take a break here in a minute but i want to explain how the telescope giveaway thing is going to work over here okay so you come over here you can look at these three telescopes decide which ones you like you can take one ticket for each scope of interest one ticket per scope i don't like somebody saying can i take five for one scope no. <laughs> you can take one ticket for each scope you can take one ticket for each one you walk in three tickets if you want or there's two scopes you like, you can get two tickets or one hour, just one ticket per scope. Okay, so at the end, during our door prize time, we'll draw, um, do a drawing. And you can, if you win more than one scope, like, you know, you get drawn for two of them, you, you keep the one you like and you turn the other one back in. That's how it's going to work. But you can get a maximum of one telescope per person tonight. Anybody got any questions about this? Okay. If it's confusing, let me know. But all you got to remember is take one ticket per scope if you like. And I know there's that we need to put some more tickets out here, which I will do that in just a minute. But uh, all right. so now the meeting after the meeting, after we get done here, we're gonna go up to Mod Pizza. You zoom up Millbrook, take left on Flexi Boulevard, right front of HEB. There's Mod Pizza. We'll get together there and talk about astronomy and other astronomy related topics. All righty, so we are going to take a break where you can go get yourself a DVD from the DVD library. You can come down here and select a telescope you would like to take home with you tonight. And somebody asked me at the free, there's no charge for the tickets, no charge for the telescope. These were donated by the family of Robert Trevino, who is a former uh, JSCAS uh, member and uh, Johnson Space Center engineer. So his family donated some telescopes to us, and their wish was that our membership could um, get some use out of these telescopes. So that's, that's how we got them. All right, let's take a break and probably 10 minutes, and we'll get back together. Somebody mind hitting the lights over there? Uh, <laughs> That's what I put the fear of uh at the store and the bunch of even older and cheaper than that. So yeah, very limited in the quality, yeah. right? With a four inch scope. In other words, all I do is see him. I have to the right answer, Chris. That's what happens when you buy a nice big new wide screen. I can't see. Not really, I can't see very much. So it'll be very disinteresting instead of more interesting. I like that. Yeah, it'll be less encouraging. That's just me. Great. It's already hard to get kids. It takes like a whole presentation from the floor. So, I mean, you know, that's like the area that you're going to have to do. 
Yeah. And the other problem with it is, I worked there for a few years. So the line is not going to get a I mean, 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 I I told you the strength line. They are the next color. Yeah. They're, and they, they're a lot of fun too, but it, it does change the dynamics. So, like, he's found out he's, he's unwilling to figure out how to line things. He'll go in and stand in there when it's a light day. That's how hard it is. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
a model of the basically part of this it's big and it's like I'm trying to bring because they don't go putting so but anyway if you do it's a memory um, so, so in order to use the sky scope they used to have the stores don't come out very right it does have a very good shield. It's funny when you we all do enough that I'm not even talking about that. I'm talking about the other. Yeah, the little one. It's like a little bit of a lot of people have telescopes that don't really know much about them. They have a lot of they have a lot of things that are there, like in the after hours. What was the what was the scene? I'm sure they had a silver moon cafe. I still don't know what's on this. Yeah, it's only cafeteria. Well, we know. Actually, on Thursday night, last we going to be Solar Maxwell. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, right. We only did a lot of ozone we did a lot of rocket building. We had a lot of programming. A lot of block programming. Yeah. So you want to try to that's right up his alley. That's what I was going to say. There are a couple of things that were right up his alley. That other one a little tiny spot on that. Yeah, I can do that. 
bit and giving this back to the world. I got into the world now, it's my bros over, which frankly brought me on my liberally position. I know it's have souls in this my thoughts. I just can I just remember we are with the last Well, if you read over again, study I mean, I, 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 I have a friend of mine that is that well, we don't know. And a whole thing of our so the project management international so because what the actions emphasize my work and the stuff I've done on the design development with awesome and get my uh professional management. So they have to so they have to go to the 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 Doing news announcements, <laughs> being able to and do, clean up yeah. the text, like, well, then, making well, sure everything's in the one that archive. So, I know about the but I don't think so. I appreciate the thing that talked about the UBS Okay, so we're starting our meeting, which means time for everybody to pay attention. Shh. Stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> I hear a professor talking. <laughs> All right, so DIY astronomy. Um, these are some celestial images from Okie Text and El and have everybody help me remember when you know this left is going to do a walk. So, <laughs> no particular one. All right, so uh, this is my telescope configuration for these images. This is a eight inch um, Ritchie Cretion on a Los Mandy geolet mount with a KF A300 base CCD camera, monochrome to use filters with it. And this other one is a 200 millimeter focal length Canon uh, camera lens. And on the Celestron ASGT mount and modified DSLR or 50 gig DSLR. So that's the cameras and telescopes we're used for these pictures I'm going to show you. All right, so the first one, this is, uh, anybody know this one? Stars? This is NGC 6559. And it's, it's actually the star forming region, and it's got some nice blue reflection nebula. And and red emission nebula. This is actually right next to the lagoon nebula. So if you ever look at the lagoon, the lagoon's right here, and just directly east of it is this NGC 6559. I think because the lagoon is so big and bright and everything, I think everybody ignores this thing. But it's basically the same distance to the east as the Trifid Nebula M20 is north of uh, the lagoon. So it's actually a really beautiful area. It's got lots of variety and it's got some dark nebula here. It's got lots of different color stars. This is a star form region in Sagittarius. Okay, anybody know that one? <laughs> What's that one? 31. Yay, M31, Andromeda Galaxy. And um, so this is taken with a 200 millimeter camera lens. This was at Oki Text also. And then there's these satellite, satellite galaxies here, M110 and M. Um, 32. 
Anybody know that blue reflection that you up there? That is what we call haze in the atmosphere. <laughs> I remember that, Mike. <laughs> that is an optical anomaly. But if there's a blue reflection nebula up there, I don't know what it is. So that's, uh, and you know, sometimes we think about DSLRs are not, you know, as good as a CCD camera, but this shows you if you get a dark sky and you take enough pictures, those 22 uh, images combined, uh, you can actually get a decent image even with the DSLR. Okay. Nobody's going to get this one. I got three telescopes for anyone who knows this one. Bernard something. Uh, it may be, but the one I know, this is LVN uh, 673. And what's unique about this one, this was taken with the 8-inch ridge accretion again. This is actually in Aquila. And you know, a lot of times we don't see deep sky objects too much from Aquila, but there actually are quite a few interesting things there. And a lot of dark nebula in that area. What's different about this? I think this is the only time I've ever taken an image that's just the luminous filter only. It's usually I do luminous, red, green, and blue, or I do narrow band or something like that. But in this case, it's a black and white image just taken with a luminous filter and a monochrome camera. This is a nice big dark nebula that's in Aquila. And you can see it from out in the dark sky area. Well, LBN stands for bright nebula, doesn't it? That's LBN. That's Lynn's bright nebula. Yeah. It's not Lynn's dark nebula yeah. because there's an LDN catalog. Yeah, there's an L L D like David also. L B like L B like L boy is Lynn's bright nebula and L D is Lynn's dark nebula. Okay. Yeah. Beverly Lynn actually had two catalogs of nebula light, whatever. Yeah. Okay. Anybody know this one? Uh, I try to recognize Barnard's E. Barnard's E. Barnard's E. Exactly right. So this Barnard's E, and this is a, this one was actually kind of a, a little bit of a stinker. I've been trying to image this one for a long time, and I've got some really awful results. But this one I think turned out pretty good. The, the key to this is getting the f-stop set right, the exposure set right, and get the. It's really nice to have the, the camera white balance in the first place. It really helps. But this is actually near, this is in Aquila also. And this is Altair. We all know Altair, right? In Aquila, bright star Altair. And this is Tara, Tara Z, T A R A Z E D. So nice, nice contrast between this blue one and this red one right here. We were talking about that star party this week about the, the um, HR diagram, the different temperatures of the stars. I'll talk to some of the students will be here tonight, but this is a good example of how you can really see these different color stars and different temperatures. But right next to these two, right next to Altair and Terra Z, is this Barnard T, dark nebula. Barnard T. It was also, it's also called the Triple Cave. Sometimes you hear it called that. But... Okay. Now, yeah. You're not going to believe where this is. <laughs> okay. Yeah, this is, this is a pretty cool picture. This is the only narrow band picture I did during this, this trip. But this is, um, this is actually Sharpless 2, 116, Sharpless 2, 112. And right in here, see this little bitty, red, that little bitty dot there? This is actually done with a 200 millimeter camera lens, but with a CCD camera. That is actually Abel uh, 71. It's a planetary net. So, you know, Abel's got a lot of uh, planetary nebula in the catalog. And then over here, strain your eyes. Can you guys see this little blue circle in there? Yeah. You see that one? That is a planetary nebula also. Very similar to, like, the ring nebula. Little, little circle there, but very faint. That's a planetary nebula there also. And anybody have any idea what that star is? I'll give you a hint. It's in Cygnus. What's the, what's the big bright star in Cygnus? Deneb. Exactly right. This is right next to Deneb. Are these the DWB nebulas? These are Sharpless 2 nebula. No, I mean the overall other hazy areas, the other nebulous areas, because there's the DWB catalog for all the H2 regions in Cygnus. DWB. I'm yes. I'm familiar with that. I don't know. The answer is I don't know. Yeah. I bet it is because they're all they're, they're very big around all of the all of the around the whole of Cygnus in the main body of the of basically what it is the Northern Cross the Swan. So what's DWB stand for? 
oh God, it's three different astronomers who actually did a mapping back in the 70s, I believe it was in the 70s, trying to look at the concentration of H2 regions along constellations on the Milky Way, and they found a lot of these in the constellation of Cygnus. Cool. But it's the DWB catalog. Yeah, yeah it's, you know, it, it, and that's kind of one of the things I'm going to try to point out here is that, you know, we, we look up in the sky and we see Cygnus, or NFB, <laughs> look at Cygnus and all this stuff. Here's the lines that show where the constellation is. But, you know, there's just stuff all over in Cygnus. Cygnus is just filled with... Uh, Deep sky objects. There's just things all over the place in there. There's these planetary, there's actually three planetary nebulae here. I can't actually make that one out, but there's Abel 71, which just has a different, this is also a PK catalog version of it. And then over here is that little brown, blue planetary nebula we were talking about. Yeah. I'm sorry, what? Parakahutek. There you go. Parakahutek. So it's a good thing that Justin came tonight. He can tell us. I, do. I just didn't want to say it. <laughs> Thank you, Justin. I appreciate it. I'm more interested in taking these pictures than they actually are. But the other thing is, too, I, I think it's kind of really astounding about this. You look at this, and I mean, this is really what. That's gorgeous. This is what space really looks yep. like. I mean, really, uh, this is what it really looks like. You know, we look at it and we think it's a bunch of stars in the black sky, and that is no way what it's really like. I mean, this is Deneb, and, and there's just all this stuff, all this clouds of dust and gas just everywhere, all these objects. There's just stuff everywhere. You've got a desert environment, and you can see some of those DWBs sure. in a telescope with a with some narrow band filters for visual observing, and they have some very spooky, ghostly appearances. Yeah, it, it's really it's really a cool region. Whole thing. I remember I've tried you took a picture of the Seder and I'd be like, Yeah, this isn't it, but that actually is, is near here too. And that's really a beautiful area too. I remember that one. Got it. What's your field of view on this with that? Uh it's about five degrees by four by three degrees. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty wide. This is a this is a hundred millimeter camera lens with a CCD camera on it. Not this, this isn't taken with the, the DSLR. Yeah. The CCD camera. Yeah, I see your camera. Yeah. So what palette are you using on this Doug? I'm sorry, what? what palette are you using on this? Well, I'm, I'm mapping the, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, I'm mapping the, the hydrogen to green and the sulfur to red and oxygen to blue. Yeah. All right. So we just saw it. And also in Cygnus, okay, this is. Uh, this is actually up in here is the Seder Nebula. This is just the very edge of the Seder Nebula, which you guys may have seen Trevor's picture in the past. So that is really good. But this is the region between the Crescent Nebula and the Tulip Nebula down here. So this is and this taking a wide angle shot. Now, this is actually with a DSLR instead of a, a CCD camera. But this is a really wide angle shot. You can see just all this is different emission nebula in here and dark nebula. They're all DWBs. I believe it. So the, the region between the Crescent Nebula and the Tulip Nebula, this was taken during the uh, at El Dorado, but in between Okitex and El Dorado actually took this picture of the Tulip Nebula. So remember back here, this is the Tulip Nebula with a wide angle shot with a DSLR, right? And this is the Tulip Nebula with a telescope and narrow band taken from home with the Ritchie Cretion Telescope. The same pattern as before, so, so comparison of what an LRGB, you know, version of that looks like on a narrow band with a telescope. Did somebody say something? Yeah. Um, the, move your mouse uh, out of the other direction. Where? Uh, that bright star. That one? Yeah, then down to the that region right diagonally away from it. It's like following one of the, the <laughs> diffraction spikes. You sort of got the big red yeah, star right there. That's yes. shockwave material. Yeah, that looks like, yeah, that's what I was going to say. It looks like a shockwave. Yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah. <clears throat> you get some disruptions in the uh, in the stronger spheres in these nebulas. Mm -hmm. And down here, too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, this is actually uh, narrow band imaging. You know, it takes a lot longer. This is actually over a period of seven days, seven nights worth of data for this one. 
All right, this is my contribution to the solar eclipse pictures because we were when we were in El Dorado, we were within walking distance of the, of the center line for the, uh, for the solar eclipse. And I got some sunspots. I've seen better pictures of sunspots, but I was glad I got a few sunspots. And you guys may be wondering, well, wait a minute, if you're so close to the center line, where's your picture where the moon is perfectly centered in the sun, right? So this right here is where I had an equipment malfunction. Oh, no. <laughs> my camera stopped working and my computer stopped working. I restarted everything. And there's a four minute gap there where I missed that. The big one. So. Equipment problems. They're just wonderful. Yeah, but got the rest of it. Okay, this. Anybody know this one? It's both. This is, this is, I'm not going to make you guess, but this is a gigantic globular cluster, this M22. It's in Sagittarius. And when we were out this last week at the star party here, you was clearly we were talking about M13, you know, which is the great, they call it the great globular cluster of Hercules. Well, this one is bigger and brighter because the great globular cluster of Hercules is like 15 or 16 arc minutes across. This one is 24 arc minutes across and it's brighter. So it's in Sagittarius. It was, it's actually bigger than what we consider to be the great uh, globular cluster of Hercules. Okay. Anybody know that one? Wow. Without reading the captions. I can't see it. That's G. That's that's M78. It's supposed to be the brightest uh, reflection nebula in the sky. This is an Orion. And this is NGC uh, 2071. It's right next to it. I also captured this over here, which I have no idea what that is, but it's kind of cool too. Another, one thing also to note about these images is you see these stars down here and they look really red. And you think, well, wait a minute, what's wrong with your image processing? You got these red stars that are not right. Well, the reason these, those stars are red is because those are the ones that are buried in the dust and gas. <clears throat> so the blue is filtered out, and what you're seeing is what's left over is the red. You can see being buried in the dust. Right. So the ones that are really, really red, they are behind this thing, and the ones that are, you know, white or blue or whatever, they're actually in front. You see up there in the uh, upper right there, you see those red spots? Mm -hmm. That's actually a group of Herberg Haro objects. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that would be my guess of what that is, but I, didn't, I don't know what it is for sure. And then there's one that's a trail to the left above. If you take that, if you take your laser pointer towards the left, no, uh, right from there, there's actually a series of red dots. Oh, here? Yes, that's another trail, a grouping of Herbert Haro objects. There you go. Good old Herbert. All right, last one. This is um, this NGC 7129 Reflection Nebula in Cepheus. Now, okay, so this one's kind of cool because, I mean, you know, it's got, it's a blue reflection nebula here, but also look at some of this stuff. Like, there's a little squiggly, uh, Emission nebula in there and see that? You don't see that every day. And then there's this line of this emission nebula through here, and there's maybe some more Herbert's objects down there. I'm not sure. You know that one, Justin? No, I mean, it could be just uh, just some illuminated islands. I mean, you've got, look how you have a bunch of Doshavi uh, dark nebulas up there. And those, you know, those, those, those striations there, which are about just a bunch of huge uh, carbon monoxide molecular clouds. And this, the other nice thing about this area, even though this looks like an optical problem, this actually is a, it's actually a yellow reflection nebula around this star and this star. Yeah. It, may, it may look like a, an aberration, but it actually is a real reflection nebula. So the diffraction spikes are caused by <laughs> your spider on your telescope? Yeah, the Ritchie creation, the way it works, is it's not like a schmidt cassegrain has a corrector plate. The Ritchie creation actually has a, the secondary is actually held in with a spider and it's open to the air. So that brings me to the next question. I'm assuming this is more than one image, right? Oh, yeah. In fact, one thing that's interesting about this, I gathered data from Okie Text and El Dorado both to make this image. So, how in the world were you able to not have your diffraction spikes get in different arrangements in two different time periods for long periods of time for the picture taken? It's called focus and tracking. And it in in your arrangement on your tube did not rotate at all to do this for, for two different locations. Yeah. Wow. 
Yeah. Well, that's true. I mean, I mean, one's not <laughs> down in Texas. Right. But yeah, they combined okay. Without any problems. Hmm. That's a good point, though. Yeah. I have had problems in the past with the refraction spikes not lining up. That had to do with either tracking problems or focus problems. But with this one, I you know, I've seen some other imagers have done this one. I've seen really horrible versions of this one, I've seen really good ones. And this art, this one's kind of a mediocre version of it, but it's uh it's really an interesting object. It's kind of a tough one. I had to you know, had to put a lot of days into it to get something. Okay, anyway, so that's what happened with those two star parties. And if you want to see my other astronomy adventures, you can Look at my webpage, www.holland-observatory.net. Let me see if I can find some lights for, <coughs> hold on. Dan, I'm just going to use your slide just to give Leslie some light, okay? Okay, okay. now, hold on, wait, 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 Dan, not yet, hold on, hold on. Well, Leslie, or yes. can you tell us your, what you want to tell us? Um, essentially, uh, one of the things I found is there's going to be another star party next weekend next Saturday, and it's being put on by the Houston Public Library. It's going to be over at Gragg Park. That's where the old, the original NASA building was. It then got turned into a um, Parks and um, Rec headquarters. Pub. I'm sorry, go ahead. Parks and Rec. Yes, I know. Okay. I'm sorry. Sorry. Why don't you give it to you? <laughs> sorry. sorry. Um, at 6 p.m., they're going to have um, a walking tour of the original NASA building. And at 6.30, there'll be um, Stephen C. Smith will share some uh, NASA news. He's one of the um, senior public coordinators uh, at JSC still. Then they're going to have various vendors and partners on hand, and they're going to have of course, telescopes and like set up to look. The other neat thing is they're going to have some, they apparently made some space exploration passports for folks and they'll hand those out and then they can take them around, get them stamped, whatever. I was thinking, boy, that'd be nice to get a lot of those to give out to people. Yeah, we used to do that. We used to do a stamping program, have people go around and look at the telescopes mm -hmm. and then they did it, we give them a stamp and then mm -hmm. they get a certificate at the end of the night. A long time ago, back when we uh, presented at uh, LBI. So tell us the date again, Leslie. It will be uh, next, not tomorrow, but a week from tomorrow. Okay. And it will, it uh, starts at 6 p.m. And I think it goes until about nine. Well, do you know who's bringing the telescopes to that? Uh, they're asking for for telescopes. Oh, they're asking. For they're them. And they're also asking for them. And who who is they that's organizing? Houston Public Library. Houston Public Library. Oh. Okay. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And you can find it at uh, HoustonLibrary.org. HoustonLibrary.org. It should it should be listed on their website. I don't have a feel for where Grant Park is. Where it's is. at. Um, the uh, Wheeler is where essentially where Telephone Road and Wheeler intersect. So it's kind of like there's Telephone Road, Wheeler, and um, Wayside. Wayside. But that's where the um, what they now call Gragg, G R A G G Park. Okay. All right. Thank you, Leslie. Appreciate it. Okay, so that's it, right, on that one? Yeah. Okay, so next up, we got Dan's going to come tell us about the eclipse at JSC. So how many of you are um, trying to get the eclipse of bachelor degree? Well, you should. I'm because good. that's how I got the call. Yeah. It was connections on the astronomy call uh, Society of the Pacific, I believe. That was organizing uh, the kind of classes that uh, the Space Center, which is JSC Visitor Center, uh, gave you a call, sent me email, and uh, it did not uh, fail. But of course, uh, some of us in the Foundation for International Space Education we were also working for NASA at Johnson, and I'm on the board. 
and uh, I'm teaching some of the classes, so that helped. But uh, it was a really very, um, it was an honor. It was very exciting. I was uh, like a kid uh, when uh, I was called upon uh, to help with the uh, Eclipse at Johnson. Uh, we had uh, a booth of the Youth Centers Medical Society since uh, I did not request permission of David to do that, so it was at Cheyas. And I brought with me uh, three telescopes. I had my wife, my daughter, I had my uh, uh, Eightish SCT, which I owe uh, to our uh, uh, dear friend Don Hunter. That's uh, his telescope, the uh, donated to me when the Don was still alive. And um, I had uh, my uh, contraction uh, of a normal spotting scope I used to shoot at the range. And I used a projection device. I was very excited to see the uh, picture uh, that uh, was shown earlier. Um, I, um, um, I forgot your name, Hamid. Um, I am getting old. I'm so sorry. Uh, but is it, is it Chris? Your 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 uh, talk, your stuff on Sky. I'm so sorry. Uh, Mike, Mark, 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 of course. Surely, David, don't get bored. Okay, but uh, this is getting more and more annoying. And um, you, know, you were mentioning it was 50 years ago. Yeah, when I was there, and uh, my arthritis is reminding me every day. Yeah, so anyway, uh, we have a lot of uh, people, too many uh, people to uh, uh, to uh, sell three telescopes that was silly. And I told uh, my partners that uh, uh, Johnson, it would never work because we had 3,000 people there, for heaven's sake. I'm accustomed to having to handle a lot of people by myself and uh, uh, standing in the park. Uh, but this was ridiculous, and a lot of people just gave up. Okay? There was no way that we could. Uh, and this is my uh, <laughs> my pride and joy. Basically, what I did is I took my own spotting scope, and um, I used a projection uh, technique, and I was paranoid. I would find the eyepiece. Okay, I was sure that it would explode on me. And absolutely not. I mean, yes. I tried little by little to raise the aperture. And I went full more and I checked the temperature, no problem. And um, I'm very impressed by what I can get with that. The picture doesn't do justice to it. I could see the sun spots. It was extremely clear. And uh, I would urge you to, um, to try that. So two things, please. Why don't you try to be an eclipse ambassador for the video? It's about 12 hours of, um, of training. Uh, some of it is became ours. You will be given a young student, probably, that was my case. I got a um, wonderful young woman, astrophysicist, a student. Uh, she gave you a talk here um, in a couple of months ago, actually. My dear friend, uh, now, Hani and now. She's from Senegal, so we can communicate in two languages, since uh, Senegal used to be a French colony. And uh, she's definitely is a scientist in. Uh, in the team, and uh, we got um, this uh, this possibility of going to uh, to Johnson and doing that kind of stuff. And as a reward, we are given a VIP tour, and uh, that that was the hallmark of, of my year. That's what I had. Can I, can I make a comment? Yeah. So. Dan, I uh, I actually have applied and I actually got accepted yesterday to be an eclipse star for the upcoming total solar eclipse with the Astronomy Society of Pacific. Fantastic. So my plan is to take a busload of my students out cool. and get into the path of totality. And while I don't have to go through 12 hours of training, I got to go through about three and they're supposed to send me a kit with stuff that I can use to further educate the public on eclipses. That's a very important thing we can do because you guys don't realize that, but there is a lot of expertise in this group. Why not share it? Why not share with uh, the kids? Yeah. Plant the seeds. And that's what I decided to do until I get to Gaga to do anything else. <laughs> Thank you.
Okay, next up, we got Trevor. Can tell us about Coolant Images? I got to play with some new toys. <laughs> yeah. I see it. Wow. I see it. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, just set up in my front yard. Uh, got about 45 minutes where here's kind of a sequence that I got. Uh, and then uh, got a little uh, a little bit of a video if it plays. No, it's not going to play. Hmm. Yeah, it's just going to jump to the name, maybe back up. Yeah. Before I just click on it, it would play. There it goes. How'd you get to play? I tapped on the black area. Okay. But that's the same shots just pieced yeah. together as a little animated. <laughs> and this is as far as I got into it um, before. I had to leave to go to work. <laughs> so I noticed your son's spots are got more detail in than mine did. What what how did you how did you do this? <laughs> or what filter did you use? Okay, so I got the little filter kit from Celestron. It came in a little box and it had a pair of glasses. And I took the the film out, the solar film out. And I put it inside my uh, red cat lens cap in place of the Batonoff mask. Yeah. And uh, I zoomed really far in and played with focus until I could get something that looked like that. And what camera is that? That's that's my uh, Altair camera, the 183. Okay. On on my red cat. All right. I agree. Those sunspots are really detailed. They are. I mean, and, yeah. yeah. And uh, down here, this is, I kind of thought that was kind of interesting too, this little disruption area. Yeah. yeah. And that, you know, you can actually see some of the surface detail. It looks like there's some more sunspots kind of right in here too. Yeah. They're not good. And uh, I think the, uh, Picture resolution was like 1600 by 1300, so I kind of narrowed it down. Yeah, nice. All right. You're Thank you. Little, you're on the track. So, one more. Wait, this more. What? Oh, oh yeah. You're Frankenstein. Okay. More, more fancy laser graphics. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so this is my Frankenscope. This is a cheap plastic camera lens. Uh, it was actually given to me uh, by somebody. Uh, it's got, you know, the little T ring on the back, and then um, I have an adapter I think I got from you, Chris. Oh. Um, it's a, a, it goes from that T ring down to, I think, a C thread. And then that's my uh, Celestron Next Image 10 camera on the back. So I was like, I want to see if I can do this to, to make it work and see if I can get anything. So I decided to try it out at uh, the International Observe the Moon event that was at U of H Clear Lake up on the observation deck up here. Uh, so, through the clouds, that's what I was able to get. Not bad for clouds. 
And you can see Aaron down there taking a look at it. And there's another thank you. Yeah, I guess I'm not really understanding what the Frankenscope is, but maybe someday it, it's just a it's just a tele telescope. I mean, uh, together like right, right. The camera lens with, right. the, with the camera on the back. What I don't get is what's the big long tube between the camera lens and the camera? That's the lens. I mean, that's the whole lens. Okay, you're telling me the lens actually looks like that all the yeah. way to the camera. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Actually, it stops because like. Okay. Since since this, this whole thing is the lens, yeah. But in the in the other picture, I didn't have the tele the two times converter on there. Oh, that's a two times converter right in here. So it's actually shortened to here. Oh, okay. The two times converter. All right. Whatever. Yeah. So basically, it takes it from uh, five hundred to a thousand. So what's the two times converter? Where'd that come from? I, I found it in the box that, that came with it. <laughs> and I had it Parks later together. just to, just to, I, I want to go test that out and see how, how close in I can get. Say, where did the box come from? It's really, it's, it came from a friend of ours. A friend of ours, okay. All right, whatever. It, it, they, the person was into photography and somebody gave them to him. I don't want this cheap lens. Okay. <laughs> I think you get the lens and the teleconverter for like a hundred bucks at, at Amazon. Okay. It's cheap plastic. Whatever. All right. Okay. Now, believe it or not, we have a member's minute from Paul Maley, who is in Arizona, and he wanted to submit this Cave Creek Dark Sky Night. Paul wants us to know that they had 600 people at their local Cave Creek Dark Sky Night this past week. About two miles from where I live, Carefree, Arizona. So Paul wants us to know that he is out there in Arizona and spreading the good word of astronomy. Oh, good for Paul. Thank you, Paul, for participating from afar. All right. Oh, so the next one is a DIY astronomy mind radio astronomy update. Okay, so um, some of us within the club have taken interest in radio. What are you laughing about? Oh, the log, the caraway, it cracks every time. <laughs> it works. Okay. It works. It's amazing. So yeah, magnificent. Some of us have taken an interest in radio astronomy and joined the CERA, which is a society for amateur radio astronomers in our club here. And uh, some time ago, I showed you this this uh, radio telescope, which is Chris's favorite because it's made with a piece of three, and and Trevor thought this was a. Uh, a broom handle, but it was not. It was a shovel handle. And this beautiful <laughs> Wi-Fi antenna. But it actually and it actually works very well. It has this and then um, a little low noise amplifier and I use a software to find radio, which I'm not gonna get into a good presentation about this before, and I remote into it with the Raspberry Pi. And when I showed you this presentation before, you got any idea how to make the video work, Trevor? Uh, is, is it the, which side is it? If I oh, okay. okay, there it goes. There it goes. So this is the Milky Way going by Solarium, and down here you'll see the data. This is actually the hydrogen from the Milky Way uh, passing through here. And you'll see the thing going back and forth. That's the red shift and blue shift having to do with the different parts of the Milky Way either going towards us or away from us. So I showed you that a few years ago. This was my, that was my first radio telescope. Um, experiment. So now it's like, you know, aperture fever, right? <laughs> the other uh, telescope was uh, about 1.06 meters by 0.6 meters. So this thing, I, I built a uh, seven foot, which is 2.1 meter dish just out in our backyard. And uh, this one, the other one had 24 dBi, this one's 30 dBi, it's the gain of the antenna. This one has a little, this has better resolution, seven degrees. You know, radio astronomy because of the wavelength um, resolution. You have a gigantic dish, you still got crummy resolution. It's still seven degrees. The other one's 14 degrees. You know, and then and then in optical astronomy, we think of the focal ratios. We think like an F8 scope or an F5 or whatever. 
And radio astronomy focal ratios are like 0 0.4, 0 0.4. It's way different than what we think of in optical. So the first version of this thing, this is actually just put together a week ago today. It was when this picture was taken. And it's the first one had a pyramidal horn. This is the feed antenna. So the, the dish down here, this is really just a reflector. So the reflector magnetic waves come down, it hits the reflector, and then um, it's bounced up into this feed horn. And the feed horn that gathers it, cables it down to the radio, preamp from the radio. And why, you know, one thing I want to say is why do we care about radio astronomy? You remember from Mark's presentation, he showed what wavelengths of light will actually get through the atmosphere. And radio, you know, visible light will make it through, but the radio will also. So this is something we can actually do on the ground and do things at different wavelengths than we would in visible light. So you may remember that there's a gigantic gap in the radio. So, um, you know, this just like we can do visible astronomy, we have the ability to do this, you know, on the ground. Same electronics, just different uh, antenna. This is what the horn, the horn is actually a 3D printed horn I did it at the library. And uh, it was a whole lot more material than I thought it was gonna be. But 3D print horn and then the inside is spray painted with a metallic um, conductive spray paint and the back is a, is a brass plate on the back. This is the building of the dish in our garage. Uh, people thought this was right before Halloween. People thought I was building a Halloween decoration in the garage when they looked at this thing. And this is with the um, hardware cloth. And I don't think Chris Rand is here tonight, right? Chris? No, Chris. We were at Mod Pizza and I was working on this some time ago. And I told Chris, and we were talking about I was going to put chicken uh, wire on this. He said, oh, no, no, no. Don't use chicken wire for all these reasons. Use hardware cloth. I'd never even heard of hardware cloth, but it's this. Stuff you can get from the hardware store or anywhere, and it's, uh, it's got very closely spaced um, grid, and it's more electrically good than this chicken wire. <laughs> so I use hardware cloth. But the challenge of this thing is trying to get a flat object to conform to a parabola is really difficult. <laughs> I, I spent a lot of time out there, got lots of cuts on my hands and stuff like this, trying to get this thing on here. But that was dish under construction, and you saw it. Already put together out there in the backyard. And then this is, um, I don't have a movie of it, but this thing looks a whole lot better than it works. So my, my, my Wi Fi thing had a, had, a, had a signal noise ratio of about 0.5 decibels, which in, in radio astronomy, everything's really different than optical. But this one, even with this gigantic aperture, only gets like about 0.25 dB signal noise ratio, which is awful. After all this work, this thing works even worse than a Wi-Fi dish antenna did. So that was very disappointing. So then I turned around and I said, okay, I think it's my, my 3D printed horn. And so then what I did is I implemented a helical beam antenna. Actually, Trevor's seen this thing. He actually came over and saw it. He's very impressive. Yeah, yeah. So I got this, now I made this helical beam antenna. What this is, this it's a PVC pipe with a wire wrapped around the helix and there's a reflector here and um this one actually works quite a bit better so the original wi-fi antenna was 0.5 db signal noise ratio of the 3d print horn is 0.25 then this one is greater than 1 db so it's actually working better than the wi-fi antenna but um i expect a whole lot better than that so i'm still working on this thing so it should be a lot better but one thing that's interesting about this, you know, there's the there's the building of the antenna and all that get to work. But then when you look at the data, it's actually this is what the data looks like. And one thing that's cool about this is you can see these three bumps here. There's this one, and this one, and this one. And anybody want to guess what those are indications of? Orion's belt. Yeah. Well, look at them. Look at the Milky Way. Good guess. I'm glad you, I'm glad you said something. Free arms, else want to galaxy? free arms of the galaxy. That's it. Who said that? Aaron? No. Uh, Phil. Back. This person. Okay, that's what it is. How would you know that? I've been playing with this too. <laughs> you know what? I've been playing with this too. Oh, really? Yes. What kind of, what kind of antenna do you have? A little Wi-Fi. The Wi-Fi antenna? Yeah. Oh, cool. Are you, are you a member of Sarah? <laughs> no. Well, I bought it from Sarah, but I'm not really a member. You're what? I bought it from Sarah, but I'm not a member. 
Okay. Well, anyways, um, have you been here before? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I'll talk to you afterwards. Anyway, Jerry Campbell also is doing this too. Jerry, he's not here tonight. He had something I don't understand. Some kind of frozen surgery, which I don't know what that means. Anyway, um, anyway, but yeah, that's what it is. This is this is shows you that there's there's this is showing three different arms of the Milky Way. This is actually data to prove that, that the Milky Way is actually made of multiple arms. Okay. So what kind of DB do you get? What's your signal noise ratio on your system? I couldn't tell you. <laughs> well, yeah, don't. <laughs> you know, okay, here's my thinking. Okay, I want to let's see if this guy knows. Okay. My thinking is if you have okay, the, the, the Wi-Fi dish is a certain area, right? And then this other dish is, is it five, six times bigger. So let's say if it was four times bigger. I was thinking four times should be a six dB increase in the signal. Right? Why? Huh? Why? Because dB because, is because four log of four times ten is six. That's why. So is that true or not true? I'm not the person to ask. Okay, good. But here's okay, here's the thing that made me feel better about this. I got I got pretty discouraged about this thing, but then I started looking at other people that have huge dish antennas and their signal noise ratios are tiny also. So there's something about my thinking that's not right about, you know, the so like on a telescope, you get a bigger mirror, you get a lot brighter image. And I'm thinking that this thing should have given me a lot bigger signal with a bigger dish, but for some reason I'm getting still not appreciably larger signal. I've mainly used mine to chase down noise in my house that's causing us all kinds of spikes in the signals. What? <laughs> I've got the bumps in there, but uh. But you're using for radio astronomy too? Mm -hmm. Are you are you using the uh, uh, preamp? Mm -hmm. Okay, and yeah, same stuff. The same stuff you listed. The hard stuff. Yeah. Who are who are you? Phil Stewart. Phil Stewart. Okay, great. Well, Phil, we we need to get to know you. Guys. <laughs> Come to Mod Pizza afterwards. We'll talk about it. Anyway, but that's what that is. So what's cool about it, hopefully, if, even if you guys are interested in radio astronomy or not, but the thing is, this is actually shows you, you can actually, in your backyard, prove that the Milky Way has multiple arms. So, that's that. Okay, things to do. Um, continue testing the position of the helical beam antenna, because, I, you know, trying to find the exact position of it, it does change, you know, the, the, the level of signal about the Earth position. Okay, figure out what's wrong with the 3D printed horn antenna because that antenna should be really good. And for whatever reason, that horn is a piece of garbage. And but it should be a really good design. That that should be the optimal a horn antenna should be actually the preferred uh, feed for this thing. So I need to understand why that's not working. Bill, I'm going to test a cylindrical waveguide antenna. I wish Jerry was here. I just wait for him to jump out. You know what a cylindrical waveguide antenna is? I don't know that one. It's the same thing as the coffee can. They call it the coffee can feed, but it's also a cylindrical waveguide antenna. Then I'm also going to build and test a loop uh, feed too to see how that does. So the goals are why are we doing this? To get improved 21 centimeter neutral hydrogen measurements of the Milky Way. You may remember from before when I showed you guys this before, we were actually able to measure our position of our solar system in our galaxy by doing multiple measurements or different declinations. You can actually do that in your backyard. You can also measure you can also measure the rotation rate of the galaxy with the same data. You can take this and plug it in and actually measure how how much how fast the Milky Way is rotating. Also, I want to detect and measure hydroxyl in molecular clouds. You can actually do that. Detect pulsar and active galaxies that are radio sources and implement an interferometer. I'm going to try to combine the Wi-Fi antenna plus this two meter, 2.1 meter. And put the Wi Fi antenna as far away as I can from the two meter, 2.1 meter uh, antenna, make an interferometer so you, so you can improve the resolution by combining signals from both of them. Okay, so that's what's going on in radio astronomy. <laughs> Is that painful? Okay, anyway. All right, is David here? Yes. Am I here? Where is he? I'm here. Right here. Right here. Next up is David. Doug, it's 9.40. Do you want to have me punt this until no. next month? Because we only no. got one event. Come on. All right. Yeah. We only got one event. For this, not for, uh, okay. Yeah, but you got to tell everybody what all the cool stuff we've been doing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you guys want to get the model? Yeah, before mine closes. It's not the 10.30.
<laughs> I'm sorry. He's the giveaway, right? And I got to get those away. Yeah. It's okay. That'll be quick. You know, saw the slides. It's okay. <laughs> All right, yeah, we had like almost eight events to go through. Uh, started with Okie Text. Now, Doug, Doug has already talked about a little bit about that. Evelyn Meadow will talk about Pomona, all of these all the way down. We got all these that have happened November 18th, a week from tomorrow, uh, is the last event for the club, and it's, a, it's at uh, Hack Winery. Same night as that uh, thing that Leslie talked about at the um, park, but that's the way life goes. Okay, 18th, 8th to the 16th, Oki Tax was here. Here's Doug and Brandon. Uh, Doug is getting desperate, trying to recruit new members. Um, what was the what was the K oh, 40th anniversary of Oki Tax? The 3D printed telescope is really, really cool. I took a look at that. I've seen uh, 3D prints on, on, on uh, uh, FCTs that are pretty wild too. So. El Dorado. Look nice and bare. Look like you guys had fun, although we are seeing clouds out here. <laughs> More from the El Dorado, lots of covered up scopes. Looks like a, a lot of people, few RVs. So it looks, looks that's that's Reed's back right there. That's Reed. Reed, yeah. Uh, I recognize the Academy chair. <laughs> Club's trip to Fort McCavick includes the includes the eclipse. Um got people laying around waiting for it. There's Ken over here with the small scope. Going right over, going over, over mm -hmm. the barracks. Um, had some kids out with the uh, uh, calendars, getting those cool little things. And this is off on the west side of the field, looking east. Looks like they had a grand time. Um, ooh, iPhone through the eyepiece of the Coronado. I think this was Ken doing this one, picking up the uh, picking up the flares. Uh, and then uh, B Hung managed to pull this one off. It was a really, really good one. She got almost the whole, almost the whole thing there. She didn't have an equipment failure, did she, Doug? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, just had to. Uh, September twenty second, amazing at the Evelyn Metter Library. It was really good. We had our first quarter moon. Myself, Doug Hollins, uh, Stan Lamb, and Mark Pachellis were there. Uh, lots of people uh, coming up there, including one very, very well behaved lady. Uh, the moon was hanging over the library. We were chasing with the clouds in and out periodically, uh, but they would come and go. The very next night, September 23rd, Pomona, Pomona in Manville, it was literally just the other side of 288, a little bit, little bit on the west side for us. Um, Bob and Leslie Eaton, Doug Holland, Stan Lamb, and myself. We had about 50 to 75 in attendance trickling throughout the night until we were warned that the sprinklers might come on, and then that pretty much ended the event for us. <laughs> yeah, All that calibrating, color alignment, gone to hell. Just pick it up and move it just so it doesn't get wet. Overall, we had a good time. The lady was very excited and would like to have us back out. Um, October 23rd, UH Clear Lake. No offense, Aaron. I didn't see your picture in time to get this to Doug, but you got a nice picture of the moon. Um, of that evening worked out well. I was pre-committed for, for the International Observe the Moon Night at the George. Uh, we had um, five, yeah, five sold out sessions from 5 to 10 p.m., 75 an hour. We were staffed mainly a few people with us from JSCS, Def Back, and the George Volunteer. We too were dealing with the clouds winking in and out. This is one of the few pictures I was able to get off the uh, EAA screen from the, uh, from the West Dome. Yeah. November 7th, UH, UH uh, Clear Lake. We just had that. I got that screwed up. Um, just this past Tuesday, right here in the uh, just around the corner. Had a great time. Um, a lot of people were showing stars. I'm Mark to tell us. Um, Al Kelly, myself, and Reed, as well as Doug was there. Uh, also managed to grab a number of people, managed to grab a Jupiter. I picked up my knob and moved it over here. I had a whole line of people. These three kept coming around throughout the night, getting different views of Jupiter as the night went on. It was really, it worked out really, really well. It's a good, good event. I hope to have, uh, to have more of them. And that's a culinary <laughs> eclipse. <laughs> and that's all. Um, next up, next in, uh, October. I'm oh, sorry, November 18th. Next a week from Saturday. Great. All right. Thank you, does someone mind uh, getting the lights for us up there, please? 
All right. Yeah. So, like David said, we had eight events, I think, in the last two months. That's a, that's a lot. Thank you. Okay. So, now we are going to have our drawing for our free telescopes. You had your chance to come down and look down. Time's up. People are going to go Just now. All right, so get your tickets out, and if you cannot read your ticket, let me know now. There should be a letter and a number. If you think you got two numbers or two letters, that's not right. It should be a letter and a number. There's C's and like Charlie, and there's G's like George, and there's T's. That's three letters. C like Charlie, G like George, and T. We get a good look at the fill, right? I want to fill. That's the guy gets no fill. Now I can see the daylight. All right, so the first one is T10. T10. Yeah. Who? Is that you? Yeah. You can get over here and get your telescope. Okay, T10 is that around me. That's good. You got it, man. Check on me because I'm going Gaga here. Okay, it's yours. Is it a T10? That's it. Go get it. All right, this one is G6. Over here. Here's G6. All right, Jonna, get down here. Come on, Jonna. Why are you not down here? I'm over here showing a video. Jeez. Oh, yeah, I know. Okay. Come on, we don't have all day. Let's go, let's go. Boom. G6, that was Jonathan. Which one is this? Which telescope? Why are you going the long way? <laughs> Johnny, you're driving me crazy. <laughs> yeah, I tell like that all the time. <laughs> Says her husband. Okay, come on. You want to go back up and down a couple more times? <laughs> all right, the one on the left. G6, that was yours. The black one? No, the one on the left. Oh, okay. Which one side is your left? Oh, no. <laughs> That's from here. That's your Thank you. All right, David. Yes. All right. Next one is, oh my goodness. I can't, okay, I understand that. Okay, so I'm looking for a. B2. Who's C2 in this? That you? Go get it. Uh, <laughs> Very good. Oh, did I donated by the family of Robert Trevino. He's a really great guy. I worked with him at JSC, NASA engineer, and he was a member of our astronomical society. He's one. If you've seen a famous picture of JSCAS with a bunch of people standing in front of dogs they made here in the club, he's actually one of the guys in that picture. So um, really, really great guy. I love working with him. But his family wanted to be hard close to have these telescopes. All right, that's it. Next month, uh, December 8th, we'll be here again. We don't know what our, our present presenter is going to be. If anybody's got any ideas for me next week, let me know. See you at Mod Pizza. Thanks for coming. Oh.